As the ball dropped on New Year's Eve last year, we had a vision for what 2020 would bring. In a matter of months, that crystal clear 2020 vision had become blurry. As our goals and hopes for the year had to be changed, people started to ask, when will we go back to normal? After all, going back to normal would solve all of our problems, right? But what if normal was broken? Let's start this year by looking at things in our life that we hope don't go back to normal. From faith to finances, from relationships to racial divide. Let's move forward instead of going back to the broken normal. Hi there, my name is Josh. I wanna thank you for joining me for another study session in this series called Renew Normal. Back in 2020, the early part of 2020, when the pandemic was first being realized, I think a lot of us were wondering to ourselves, when are things going to go back to normal? Or even saying, I can't wait until things go back to normal. But the question is, were there things in our lives that actually are not worth going back to normal? Maybe they weren't all that great to begin with, and there really isn't any reason or need to go back to those things. And so over the course of this series, I've been looking at things like anxiety and hurry and devotion. And today I want to look at finances. Now, before I hear uh, that collective groan, that usually comes with uh, this topic on finances. I just want to offer up the, the understanding that we all are coming at this from different perspectives, different circumstances. Our lives have been impacted by this pandemic, financially speaking, in many, many different ways. But what my hope is, is that the principles that I will share today will actually transcend our circumstances and that the perspective that I'm talking about is going to be more eternal than it is in kind of the here and the now. So that, that's my hope anyway. And so I have four questions that I want to work through together. But before we go through those questions, I want to make sure that I kind of lay the groundwork a little bit and let, um, let us all know where we were at just prior to the pandemic and where we are today when it comes to finances. Specifically, individually speaking, the Federal Reserve reported back in late 2019 that when faced with an unexpected expense of $400 or more, 40% of people could not pay for it. Maybe you're one of those people, or maybe you know people in your lives who were very much in this place, financially speaking. And if that wasn't enough of a, uh, a statistic to share, let me put it into a macro perspective. So the national debt in 2008 was reportedly $9.986 trillion, which, which in itself is a huge number and one that is definitely hard to wrap your head around. around. But in just over a decade, so in 2021, that number has nearly tripled. And get this, that number today, the national debt is $27.836 trillion. Dollars Again, a huge number. But I think, if anything else, what it does is it, it proves something about our culture, doesn't it? Whether you take it from an individual basis or you take it from a countrywide basis, I think that we live in a culture that celebrates more, that encourages us to go after more, 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 more. Every day we are bombarded with marketing and with advertising and with messages that tell us and sell us on this idea that more is better. And if we don't have enough money to buy those things outright, go ahead, just borrow it. <laughs> it's, there's plenty more where that came from. And so most, most people believe that the answer to their financial situation is to get more money. The problem will be solved by just getting more money. But I want to challenge that notion. And I want to look at it from kind of a different perspective. I know for years that was my perspective is that if I just get more money, then my problems will be solved. But I, I want to look at it from a, a different perspective and, and maybe from 
a kingdom perspective, if, if you would allow. Perhaps the solution is that we more wisely use the resources that God has entrusted with to us every day, as opposed to looking at ways that we can accumulate more. How can we better manage what we are already given and recognize that we've been entrusted with actually quite a bit? So question number one, will this perspective prevent me from living generously? So will this idea of focusing in on what is given to us every day by God, will this prevent us from living generously? No, it won't. <laughs> and I want to start out by sharing this, is that like me, my wife grew up middle class and like me, she did not really want for much. Uh, we didn't have a lot necessarily growing up as kids, but at the same time, we were growing up in America. And then and now, we are considered the top one to two percent wealthiest people in the world. And so that means that 98 to 99 percent of the world has less than us. So that is a perspective that we need to recognize as well, that even though we don't live necessarily these extravagant lifestyles. We don't, we're not living the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. And her family would always say that they were rich in the things that mattered. And I actually really loved that saying, even though they would oftentimes say it in a way to kind of laugh off the notion that they didn't have much material wealth, or at least compared to, you know, like I said, the rich and the famous. It was said tongue in cheek as a way to try and combat the world's definition of wealth. And yet at the same time, it had a great deal of truth in that. Because what really matters is more than what the world has to offer. Wouldn't you agree? The Apostle Paul agrees, I think, by giving us a good idea of what really matters in his first letter to Timothy. So first, first Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good, good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. There is so much richness in this passage alone. I think we need to recognize that God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And so he wants to provide for us. He wants to provide for us abundantly so that we can enjoy those things. And we're also commanded to do good and to do good deeds and to care for others um, by sharing, you know, what we're given with, with others. And I think it's important too for us to recognize in a passage like this, we can easily dismiss it because it says, command those who are rich. And we may have this perspective that we aren't rich, but like I just said, we just living in this country are some of the richest people in the world. And, and it may not feel like it on a day-to-day -day basis, but if we have a better understanding and a better perspective that we are indeed quite rich, Maybe that will help change our, our posture and our understanding of finances. Viewing money as simply a provision from God helps us to put our trust in Him and not in our material possessions. We recognize that the source of our provision is God. The source of our fulfillment is God. The source of our enjoyment is God, not the things, not the material possessions, not the financial resources but God himself, he is the one who is providing and he alone is the one that we should look to for our, our fulfillment and our enjoyment. As Billy Graham once said, I never saw a U-Haul behind a hearse. So no matter how much we store up, you and I both know we can't take it with us. Eventually money is going to be of no use to us. Our material possessions are gonna be of no use to us. They're gonna be given away, they're going to be sold off, who knows what, but they are no use to us after a certain point of time, when we've run out of time. <laughs> so why should we spend so much time 
accumulating money? Why should we be consumed with pursuing money and material possessions? Why do we allow the pursuit of money to control every action we take and every decision that we make when we know that we can't bring it with us? That is that eternal perspective that I think you and I can have. And realizing that money is nothing more than a provi provision or tool to be managed actually makes it possible for us to live even more generously because we are not intent on simply storing up money and hoarding wealth. Instead, our energy is being put towards something greater than just the accumulation of money and things. And when we come to recognize that money should flow freely through our fingers rather than just line our pockets, I think it leads us to living more generously. We recognize that these, these things, these dollars are not meant to stop with us, but are actually meant to flow through our lives and into the lives of others. So question number two, will this erode our financial margin? Will this idea of living generously, of living on what God has given us, has provided us each and every day, will that erode our financial margin? And it could be seen that living generously would start to cut into our financial reserves. After all, you can't keep sending money out with money not coming in, or you know, if you're sending out more than what's coming in. But again, I think that's a worldly view of looking at money. And in fact, I believe it limits us to the economics of this world. I know time and again in my life, the, the numbers have not added up based on what I, I understand and what God actually provides. There, there have been numerous times in my, in my life where I have been provided for in ways that I could have never imagined, never could have made up, never could have anticipated. God is providing time and time again and I need to recognize that I can rest in that and know that he wants to provide for me abundantly. Ecclesiastes 7:12, Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this, wisdom preserves those who have it. So our growing wisdom actually helps us to become even better stewards of the resources that God entrusts to us. Learning to lean on God rather than on our own understanding makes it possible for us to gain knowledge that is more profound than what the world alone can provide to us. We have a perspective that is not limited to just this world, but we have a perspective that is eternal and forever, a, a godly view of money and resources. And this kind of wisdom actually helps us know how to better manage our money as opposed to money managing us. We are not responding to the, the things that are coming at us, but we are actually better able to manage and to project and to see uh, beyond what is just before us, the here and the now, that perspective that is beyond just the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Question number three, does this help us prepare for the future? When we have a godly view of money, we are very much set up for the future. We are very much prepared for the future. And here's how, we no longer chase after money. Instead, we follow God's lead and the money helps support those promptings. Again, we flip the script, haven't we? We're not chasing the money, we're actually chasing God. And we're looking to God to provide the direction and the guidance. The money and the financial resources are there simply to help support those promptings and for us to be able to go after the things that God is calling us to. And as a result, I think we're able to better develop clear goals of what we want our money to accomplish. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I think we need to remember this. No matter what, we are going to sow and we are going to reap. We really have no choice in the matter. Every decision that we make leads to sowing and reaping. 
The choice we do have is how we are going to go about it. Are we going to be generous or are we going to be sparing? So this means that we actually have quite a bit of say in our future and what it will look like based on the generous or sparing decisions and choices. Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. I think when we read a passage like this, it's easy for us to fall back into that worldly view of money once again, because we look at the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. We kind of stop there. But instead, if we keep a godly view of money, we go beyond that and we recognize that the blessing actually isn't the wealth. The blessing comes in the lack of painful toil. And what I mean by that is how often have we come to a decision to make and we struggle and we agonize over that decision. Should we give our money to this? Should we spend it on that? Should we send it to this organization? Should I invest it in this opportunity? Whatever it might be. And so we agonize and we toil and we are painfully aware of every step that we make. And what I would say is that when we have a clear understanding of God and his greater purpose for us and for our resources, then decisions like this are much less painful. And, and we don't toil. We certainly go through the process of making a good decision, making sure that it fits within our goals, within what God is calling us to. But we don't agonize over it nearly as much. And we have a clear path laid out before us already instead of each one of those decisions clearing the path. So the decisions as they come to us are less painful. They're less pressure filled and we're able to make them with a clearer sense of what the bigger picture is moving forward. Question number four, will this maximize the use of each dollar? When we trade in this notion that we need more money for a mindset that we should use the provisions that God has entrusted to us each and every day in the best way possible, then yes, I think we can maximize each dollar. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And when we have a plan in place, each dollar can be accounted for and we can be good stewards of our resources. And, and I know it, having a plan sounds rigid. It sounds like it's inflexible and it doesn't sound very fun. But in fact, I would argue just the opposite. I would say that having a plan in place actually gives us more flexibility, more margin to respond to the unexpected. We can actually be more spontaneous with a plan in place than we can be without one because we have a clear sense and understanding and idea of where our money is already being sent, where it's going, instead of simply guessing and hoping. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 8. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And another rich passage about finances. And I love every element of this. And if you just read it line by line and, and focus in on what's being said, it's, it's incredible. But I want to start with the very first line. It says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. You and I are invited to decide in our hearts what to give, not to simply just kind of respond in the moment, but to, to have a plan in place, to be organized, to decide already what direction we would want to go because of what God is calling us to. We are actually invited to do that. God loves a person who gives cheerfully and we can more cheerfully give when we know where we're giving and why we're giving and what that means, kind of the, the greater purpose of it all. And I think what's really important to recognize here too is the last line. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God, like it says here, generously provides all that you need, all that I need. He gives us so much that we have enough for ourselves and enough to share with others. So you can see that, that God is 
wanting to provide for us, that we don't have to strive and to chase after the money and the possessions. He wants to give those things to us and not just to us, but that we would then use to share with others that that provides for us and we're able to share with others and what an incredible invitation that is from God. And so if I could provide you with just one resource to walk away with today, it would be Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And it absolutely changed and transformed the ways that we look at money. And I would say that it has better positioned us today to be in a place where we can live generously and we can be mindful of the money and the resources that God provides us each and every day. And that we can use those to not only provide for ourselves, but to share with others. Because I know for us, we have tailored that to fit our season of life. And, and while we don't follow it exactly the way that we did when we first started, it certainly still provides us with something that is really, really important. More than the process, more than the program, it gives us a plan that we can follow and something that is kind of ingrained in the ways that we uh, go about our lives. That's all I wanted to share during our study session today. But like I always say, hopefully we'll just simply start a conversation or maybe we'll start some wheels turning in your own mind as to how you might be able to better uh, manage finances from a perspective that isn't about accumulating more wealth and more, more possessions, but is more about how to better use and utilize the, the provisions that God gives us every day because he loves to provide for us and to pro provide for us abundantly. And so I wanna thank you for joining me today. If you haven't already, would you mind clicking on the subscribe button? That way you can be notified when a new study session comes out or a new video comes out. And like I said, hopefully this is starting some good conversations. Certainly go back and watch any other videos in this series that you may have missed. I encourage you to do that. And hopefully we don't slip back into normal. Instead, we take a look at ways that we can renew normal. And so with that, thank you again. Blessings to you. And until we see each other, take care.